All right, welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. We have many friends with us this evening, uh, or this afternoon or morning, whenever you're listening, I suppose. Um, two of these friends have been with us before, Brian and Joseph, and our new friend is married to Joseph and is a former classmate of mine. Hello. Uh, Talitha, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, sure. Hello, my name is Talitha. I am married to Joseph. I went to the same school as uh, everyone else for kindergarten through 12th grade, so I've known most of you for quite a while. And uh, Uncle Greg, you are uh, I've known you for a really long time, so. <laughs> and I've known you even longer. <laughs> so happy to be here. We're glad to Welcome. have you. Thank you. So last week we talked about the Trinity and we reviewed Arianism and the Council of Nicaea and just briefly touched on the dual procession of the Holy Spirit. And we realized we needed a lot more time to talk about these things. <laughs> so Arianism is a heresy that subordinates Christ to the Father in essence is saying he's not God, he's something like God, but he's not God. That makes him less. Um, and it turns out there are a lot of different heresies that do the same thing in essence that we we call subordinationism. So what is the essential problem with subordinationism? That was a pun, right? Is it? Essential, I missed it. Essential problem. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are talking about the essence of God, who and what is God in himself. And one of the first problems the church had to face was those who said, well, first of all, Arius actually didn't say Jesus is like God. He said the Son is mm -hmm. not at all like the Father. The Son is so not like the Father. He is an absolute creature, and the distance there is infinite. But at the Council of Nicaea, a lot of people rejected Arius out of hand, but still clung to the idea of a similar essence. He was, whatever the Father is, whatever that God stuff is, Jesus was of the same sort of stuff. He was like the Father in essence but a different, apparently a different being, not of the same essence of the Father, not God, really, really like God. It's like God as you can imagine, but simply not God. And the Council of Nicaea, through lots of wrestlings back and forth, and lots of arguing, and lots of appealing for scriptures, came up with a final pronouncement that Jesus is of one essence with the Father, homo usia, God from God, light from light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. So that's kind of where we left off last time. We, we saw what the church saw in the Bible. And we have to be very careful. The church was not legislating. The church was not making things up. The Council of Nicaea did not invent a new religion. And you can find people who will tell you it did all of those things. The church was recognizing what the church, in fact, had always taught. Bishops at Nicaea were saying, this is the gospel. This is what we've always said. This is what the Bible says. This is the truth. And in the face of all error, we are going to not only say it in biblical language, we're going to say it in other language to confront those who try to get around the plain language of Scripture by reinterpreting it. And so we have Nicaea. Generation later, Constantinople came along and fixed some of the loose pieces and tied up some loose ends and put a bow on it. And from there we have what we now know as the Nicene Creed, which has been confessed by the church ever since, by all wide branches of the church at least. And we say with great confidence, the confidence rooted in scripture, Jesus is God. There's only one God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but there's only one God, and yet the Father's not the Son, the Son's not the Spirit, the Spirit's not the Father. And we stand back and say, and we don't completely understand how that is, but we understand the words of Scripture clearly enough to say that much and to insist that it's true. So that's sort of where we left off. Where, How shall we proceed from there? <laughs> well, let's talk about ESS briefly. Um, ESS or eternal subordination of the sun is a theory that uh, gained a little bit of popularity in recent years, at least on the internet. The intentions were good, I think, as people were trying to defend a view of marriage where husband and wife have complementary rather than identical roles. Mm -hmm. 
And from there, they said, oh, you know, yeah, uh, husband and wife, they're equal in value as human beings, just like God and Jesus are essentially the same in essence, but the son is eternally subordinate to the father. Like that's his, his role. That's what's proper to him in his nature, which actually makes his nature different than the nature of the father's. And I think you just brought up the issue and solved it all at once. And I'm not really <laughs> sure what more we say to that. Oh. <laughs> Anytime because you have that dumb. many qualifiers, something has already gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, we, when we say that they are of the same essence, we're saying that it's the same being that we call God. And by the nature of that confession, by the nature of that truth, there's no room for subordination. Making distinctions, surely. The Father's the Father, the Son's the Son, the Son's eternally begotten of the Father. But with regard to the divine essence, to any particular attribute that we perceive as human beings, they are both fully, completely God. And neither one is subordinate to the Neither one takes orders from the other because he has to. Now, can they like, I, part of the problem here is the word equals. Equals is a mathematical term. One apple and one apple are equal because of that little number one in front of them. But no apple is actually the equivalent of any other apple. And whereas they may substitute great in making apple pies, in reality, they are two very different things. So the, the, the whole issue of equal, unless you're going to say, yes, they're equally God, because we're talking about the same God. It's the God who made the world, that God. The Son is that God. The Father is that God. Then you can say equal, equal in majesty, equal in glory, equal in power. But go, anyway, that was a tangent. <laughs> well, maybe that we can clarify between uh, this idea of eternal subordination and economic subordination, because we yeah. do use that term to describe Jesus' work. Oh, and that's um, right. Thank you, because that's yeah. actually where I was going. Very good. So given who they are, they can, as persons say to one another, let's do this, and they can have an agreement between themselves. And as we look at Scripture, we do see evidence that from eternity, the Father takes a lead in decreeing and planning and appointing and assigning the Son. And the Son, not being forced, not being a lesser person in this arrangement, nonetheless agrees out of the love he has for his Father, and the desire to glorify his father, he takes up this assignment to become the incarnate savior, to go to the cross. And the Holy Spirit agrees to work with both of these, to glorify the son, to glorify the father, glorifies the son by sending him. And in all, we have this incredible piling up of glory upon glory as each manifests love for the other. That's the scripture teaches. And we can point out plenty of passages where we can see this, what you rightly call economic subordination, that is, with regard to the management of, of creation and the management of redemption, they do take up roles that are in some measure appropriate to their names, but we can't read from that back into the essence of God and somehow start carving up God and say that some of God is lesser than other parts of God. Oh, partialism, there we go again. <laughs> God doesn't have parts, and so there we can't have some part of God less than some other part of God, uh, which if we do that, then we tear up the Godhead and we're left with polytheism or something. And that's uh, that's something similar. When, when it comes to the idea of subordination, it, it implies two of something. There There is something yes. that is different and has to be put beneath the other. And if God, the Son in eternity, has a different will, he wants something else mm. than what God the Father wants, and he has to subordinate his will to the Father's will, then he's no longer God. Yeah, and then he's, he's not a, he's a different being. Because too. God wills yeah. perfection. And there there's nothing that you can take away from perfection that leaves mm. in perfection. Excellent. So if God the Son has per something taken away from the perfect perfect will of God that makes the Father's will more perfect, then you have imperfection. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's something that, that falls out of what you just said. And I think that we 
who dabble in theology don't emphasize enough. We, we say that there is one divine essence, and in this essence, the attributes in the essence are equivalent. That is, there's not... The, the, anal the analogy I've been using lately, imagine Mr. Potato Head. Mr. Potato Head represents the being or essence of God. And then to this, we plug in some, you know, lips of omniscience and some eyes of omnipresence and some ears of love and some hat of kindness. And, you know, we attach all of these attributes to some basic underlying essence. This is not what the Bible teaches. God is love. He is light. He is truth. He is joy. He is his own will. He is his own heart. He is God. And we can't tear that into pieces. Now, what this means practically with regards to the Trinity is there are not three wills in God. There are not three sets of emotions. There are not three minds. There is the divine essence, which is, is and includes mind, will, emotions. And we could, we had higher degrees in theology. Maybe we could define that a little better, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but this, this much is clear. That's God. And each of these persons shares all of that essence. So that it's not, it's not what the Jehovah's Witness accuses of. We don't have a three-headed God. We don't have a three-minded God or a three-willed God who shares some kind of essence at some lower level. The essence of God is mind, is love, is will, is sovereignty, is joy. Uh, and it's at this point particularly where we stand back and say, I don't know how that works. And that's okay. <laughs> to to draw that out a little bit more, you were talking about uh, we don't have a three headed god that shares some deeper essence. A book I highly recommend to anybody who is listening to this, and to anybody in this call who would like to read it, is "All That Is in God" by James mm -hmm. Dolezal. He's a Reformed Baptist pastor. I forget where he teaches, but he wrote his dissertation on divine simplicity. Mm. And it is phenomenally well written. And he he took the dissertation and, and wrote it into a popular level book that someone like me can read and understand. <laughs> but he he talked about a lot about what the importance of simplicity is because it, and the basic analogy that he used was if there are parts within God and there's something that is deeper than them that is what we call God likeness then everything else on the outside of it is periphery. Mm -hmm. It is accidental. It's not part of his essence. So you basically have godness and then on the outside, something that isn't God that we call the father and something that we call the son and, and the Ooh. spirit. Right. So it has to be a simple, not composed of parts essence. Yes. For God, the father and God, the son and God, the spirit who are distinct, but not separate. I'll insert the creed here um, <laughs> in order for them to be considered properly God. And for the sake of anyone who is listening, we all do adhere to the ecumenical creeds and try to understand them as they were intended. We don't try to impose our own misunderstandings on them. At least we don't think we are. And, you know, we, and, we, and we read other people who are trained in theology to make sure that what we're doing is consistent with what the church, in particular the Reformed Church, has taught. So we're not making this up as we go. We're not a bunch of heretics. We're not imagineers when it comes to theology. We are trying very much to be faithful to the creeds of the church. And thank you, Brian, for bringing in the word simplicity, which is exactly what word needs to come <laughs> at this point. And we're talking yeah. about the simplicity of the divine essence. Father, Son, and Spirit are not three parts. Each is fully and completely God and possesses the divine essence in its totality. Otherwise, you get exactly what you described. You're quite right. Mm -hmm. There was a professor, moving on to the Holy Spirit, who we haven't talked much about so far this episode. Uh, there was a professor at my college who infamously once remarked that the filioque clause was not really that big of a deal. Uh, <laughs> what do we think about that? Oh, way back in 1984, my, my own teacher and pastor, uh, C.W. Powell Jr., gave me a, a Christmas present. I was a, I was a teenager. It was uh, called Armageddon in Prime Time. The author was George Bailey, who was a uh, news correspondent and also did some intelligence work uh, behind the Iron Curtain. I think it was in East, Berlin, or East or West Berlin, I forget. And so he, he saw the Soviet empire from the inside. And as he wrote this book, his, his prediction was that in 1984, as the Cold War is over, the Soviets have lost. 
they know they've lost. It's just a matter of time now. And the reason had to do with our technology and their very poor technology. In, in a word, in America, our problem is keeping hackers out. In the Soviet Union, their problem is keeping hackers in because they didn't want a free flow of information into the country. They didn't want to see the next generation. They didn't want the next generation to see what the free world looked like because, of course, they've been lying to their people. And they were finding it more and more difficult to do that. And furthermore, our, our generation of hackers were going up to be next decade's computer engineers. Their non-hackers were going up to be pretty much absolutely nothing. So we had an unstoppable technological edge that was manifest first in uh, the moon landing and then later in SDI. And so George Bailey is saying, this is inevitable, this, 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 this war is over. But to your point, I do not know if the man is a Christian. He never says so, doesn't say he's not. But in passing, he says, the difference between the Soviet Union and the United States can be traced back to an obscure doctrine. It's this thing called, and he's talking to people who have no idea what he's talking about. I'm not sure how well he understood it, but he, he, he recognized it. It's this doctrine called the Philoquy Clause, uh, which emphasizes that the Spirit and the Son both have their origin in the Father, but that the Spirit also proceeds from the Son. And this puts the Spirit, and he doesn't say it like this. He, he has a very simplistic kind of approach to it. But what we, where we were left with are the models for two possible ways of looking at society. We have the top-down, czarist, mafia, godfather, Soviet Union approach, where we have an authority at top, and all authority flows down in separate, unrelated channels, and only the guy at the top really knows what's going on. Or we have the Western Republican communal sort of thing, where both the father and the son are breathing the spirit back and forth to one another in complete love. And, and unity. And here then we have the possibility of fellowship and community and of authority standing side by side rather than being posed wholly from the top. Now, that was his take, and we can, we can flesh some of that out. But he brought it down to the Reformation and said, and you, you channel this to the Reformation and you get the Protestant minister, the, the preacher in a business suit, who relates to people who do business. On the other hand, you get Greek orthodoxy and you get people in robes swinging incense through the air and bowing down before pictures. And he saw this; these were very different things. The Eastern Greek Russian view of the spirit is the spirit is the personal possession of the father and is not directly related to the son. And that creates two streams of revelation. The son is the logos, the word. The spirit is some kind of other power through which God reveals himself. And so word and worship become separate things. And there are two different ways of enjoying God, by studying theology or by simply experiencing the spirit without the mediating word. Whereas in the West, the two go hand in hand. Worship, love, emotion go hand in hand with divine revelation in Jesus and in scripture. And there's no conflict. And so the Soviets ended up inheriting a basic Russian mindset of top-down line of authority, while in the background, the Christian community was still essentially mystic, except where Western missionaries had made inroads. And even there, there was a good deal of Pentecostalism, which carried with it some mysticism. Uh, whereas the West, despite all of its secularization, still maintained the idea of a balance of authorities and uh, the possibility of uh, a community between equals. So... Mm -hmm. Does it make a difference? Well, here's one, one secular guy who understood the 20th century very well and said, yeah, you can write the history of the 20th century in terms of this talk. Now, he may have overstated it, but at least he saw that there's something going on here that even the most seemingly obscure doctrines, given a thousand years, can have profound effects on how a society understands itself, its relationship to God, and how its institutions relate to one another. Yeah. When your idea of the basic fundamental governance of the entire universe is different, are we really surprised that society ends up looking different? There's there's a connection here. It sounds like a stretch at first, but when you think about it, I think the, the connection is really deep and essential. Essential. <laughs> ah, there's the pun again. <laughs> ah, I got to stop. <laughs> <laughs>
And we're just going to keep coming back to haunt us because that is what we're talking about. We're talking about the divine essence and the implications of it. Uh, in, in, in answer to your professor, even, even if I didn't know any of what I know about the Philippic cause and its history, I would be a little surprised at anyone who said, yeah, we're talking about the essence of God, but that doesn't have really any impact for <laughs> theology, culture, society. <laughs> uh, I'm, just yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure what all the impact may be, but I'm pretty sure since we're talking about God, there's going to be one. <laughs> even even if you don't understand that that's what the filioque clause is about, it's like you can't look at something and, and see, like, you've got two streams of Christendom, mm -hmm. and one of them is in the East, and the other one's in the West, and both of them are pretty close as far as numbers are concerned, and think, yeah... They're really just uh, separating over something that doesn't matter. <laughs> well, the idea was that there was some sort of political difference that was really at the heart of it, and the filial oh, was just an excuse. But I don't see how that holds up under scrutiny either, to be yeah, honest. Not, not, not really. I haven't since... studied it much. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the Western Roman Empire at the time, it was uh, pretty top down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the West continued to struggle between church and state, and eventually church, state, and academy as the universities came along. There was, there was, it was never settled. There was never, well, obviously the emperor is in charge and everyone needs to listen to him. Nor was it ever solved for more than a very brief season that, hey, the papacy's in charge and, um, you know, he's God walking on earth and all that. Uh, even when people asserted those kind of things, it didn't last long because someone always rose to challenge. There was all, and then somewhere in there, people started suggesting that, well, hey, people, we're all God's people. Isn't the church as the body of believers? Doesn't that have some kind of balance? And even when it got secularized, and that happened early in the Middle Ages as well as later on in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, there was still this recognition that nobody here has all the power. Now, because we're sinners, we like to be tyrants. But the West, mm -hmm. in establishing a sounder doctrine of the Trinity, was able to struggle with it, even if it was a struggle. Whereas in the East, the Church simply gave in and said, "Yes, Emperor, what shall we do?" There was there was really no contest to the East. It was a simple subordination of Church to State. The State, the, the Emperor being the direct representative of God, and the Church being one hand of what was going on here, but not. Not all that was, not all of the power of society. Well, and it's something that marks uh, Western society too. That, to my knowledge, you don't see anywhere else. Of we have a tendency to question whoever's at the top, and we've had that mm. for about a thousand years. Yep. Where you know you, you go to the east, you've got the the you know the Dalai Lama or the emperor, or you always have somebody at the top that is the unquestioned authority. Whereas in the West, and especially here in the United States, you have that very much, okay, yeah, the person at the top says do this, and we go, okay, well, why? What has he done for me lately? Mm -hmm. Just see, yeah. what exactly has he done to deserve this level of authority? Has he done anything wrong that means that he does not deserve that authority? And yeah. is there anybody better for the job? Which, as far as I can tell from my admittedly limited study of human history, that's pretty exclusive to the West. And also, you get the question of uh, of questioning the morality and just justice of that leader's uh, actual mm -hmm. command, which is why, don't quote me on this, I'm not a military lawyer, uh, <laughs> but, you know, court martials are designed to determine whether you disobeying your commanding officer's order was morally right. Yes. Well, yeah, because the, cause the, the oath is uh, threats both within and without. Yeah, there, there is, there are certain times where disobeying the guy above you is considered the right thing to do. It's just they have to, uh, they have to check it out because weirdly you're under authority too, as much as your superior officer is. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they don't want, they don't want Germany over again. Weirdly enough, <laughs> the Nuremberg, Weird. the Nuremberg trials established the principle that we were just following orders is not a sufficient defense. Um, mm -hmm light of the Holocaust and everything else, and, and rightly so. Now, the, the West had to work through this, and, and we're by no means insisting that the West is perfect in this, that has an ideal track record. And some of this, some of the things you're, develop, you're discussing have developed almost within my lifetime. When FDR was our president, he walked on water. Nobody questioned him. That whole generation 
my parents lived through that generation. You, you, you could not go to someone from that time and say, here's all the things FDR did that were wrong and unconstitutional and flat out stupid. You would get just a hail of fire of, no, don't you understand? He saved us. He took us out of, he took, he, he won the war. He brought us out of the depression. He gave us jobs. He's, and it was kind of frightening. It, it took things like the Kennedy assassination and Watergate for the American people to really stop and say, wait a minute, why exactly are we trusting the federal government anyhow? Uh, mm-hmm. it, it has been a hard road to come to terms with that. Because of that, stuff is only just starting to come out about them, too. Of mm-hmm. The shady stuff that both mm-hmm. FDR and JFK did in the background that nobody that they could do because nobody really questioned them on it mm-hmm. and that nobody would get away with today because we're watching them now. Yeah, yeah Nixon wasn't an anomaly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was just the one who got caught. Yeah, yeah if you look at it, anomaly, yeah, look at the caught. history. Yeah, it was, he basically was doing what was pretty standard for the time and couldn't figure out why it was a problem. <laughs> he he had the misfortune of, of being too slow on the uptake. <laughs> yeah. What, what's, what's the line from uh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels? To have an affair that is French, to be caught that is American? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yikes. We're going to have Why? to put a parental warning on this episode <laughs> of the podcast. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Do you guys notice any correlation between uh, romanticism and this sort of individualist distrust of authority? Because I I think of Robbie Burns, of course, a man's a man for all that. You know, we don't need no government. I see that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you you very much in the general romantic movement, you have the, the individual emphasized above the collective especially of the, you know, the it's largely centered on whatever you're, whether it's the poet or the protagonist or what have you. It's so centered on them that it's, you know, you have the usually man versus society a lot of times in <laughs> the society is the bad thing and you have the pure individual moving away from all that. And yet romanticism would call us to perfect unity with a perfect whole Yet it's always hypothetical because, as you say, society's never there. Society's always wrong. And we can think of uh, Henry David Thoreau, his different drummer, <laughs> his civil disobedience, his stint at Isn't that a Michael Nesmith song? Yeah, um, yes, I'm sure it is. <laughs> uh, and so he's, he, is a po- he is the lone individual opposing the, the standard society. And yet his best friend is Emerson, who's talking about yielding yourself to the perfect whole and identifying Jehovah with uh, Brahma and all of that. Emerson's doctrine of the oversoul, all parts of something greater. So the individual, it's all about the individual as long as he finds his meaning in the total whole of everything. But the total whole of everything is never what's going on at the moment. It's never societies that currently exist. Current society stinks, it's rotten, needs to be brought down. And so, yeah, we follow the, the lone individual on his, uh, his own imaginative track as he follows his heart, whether, as you say, it be the, the poet, the artist, the protagonist of the novel, uh, Child Herald. How did we get here? What was, what was the... I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Let's go we back to the Trinity. We were talking about the Trinity. All right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the Trinity some more. Uh, so back in ancient times when I was your student, Greg. <laughs> it's not like last year or so. It wasn't that long ago. Back when dinosaurs it roamed the earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, you issued a test. You, you, what's the word? Issue is not the verb for test. <laughs> gave? Yes, you gave us the test mm-hmm. on proving the doctrine of the Trinity from scripture. Mm-hmm. And you told us, you may use your Bible for this and anything that is written in your Bible. <laughs> yeah. So I proceeded to copy the entire chapter from our syllabus with all the proof texts into the back of my Bible. And it's the best thing I've ever done. I'm going to do this to every Bible I ever use from now on. Well, you know why I did that, right? So when the Jehovah's Witnesses yeah. come. So that people like yeah. you would actually do that. So that when the Jehovah's Witnesses came to the door, you, 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 people like you would grab your Bibles, have everything right there, and would be able to use it. I, I know I've told the story lately, but I don't remember if I told it back in your your time. Uh, it was when I taught in in Anderson, probably my 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 first or second, probably my first year. Uh, it was Saturday morning. I was doing nothing in particular. I get a phone call, and this kind of fluffy little blonde says, "Mr. Reddinger, Greg, whatever she called me, there are some people at the door, and they're saying that Jesus isn't God. What am I supposed to say to them?" <laughs> Okay, darling, here we go. <laughs> here are some verses. Write them down real fast. 
Okay, and just say this and say this and ask him this and ask him that. There you go. Lord bless you. Okay, thanks, thanks. I don't remember if I ever found out how that went, but I think that pretty much stuck in my mind as you know, when people knock at the door and say, tell us about this Trinity thing, we better have our Bibles near at hand. But if you don't know where things are in the Bible, then that's a problem. And so when I gave that test, and I still do that, I, gave, I did it not too long ago. Uh, anything that you want to permanently attach to your Bible, you can use on the test. It can't just be stuck between the pages. You have to make it part of the Bible. Okay, are we, I guess we're creating a study Bible here. But we're, <laughs> we're, 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 we're creating extended memory. Just don't don't tell the uh, the Roman Catholics. They'll think we're adding more to the yeah, canon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why would they be worried about that? They already did that. Exactly. We'll just tell them it's part of the Apocrypha. It's fine. Yeah, it's it's an it's addition to the Book of Judith. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and uh, so has has this been useful for you then, Emily? It has mostly in photocopying and giving to other people <laughs> who have wanted okay. the list. Okay. Can we add this to our um, sure notes. notes? Yes, sure notes. whatever those are called. Yeah, we'll figure out a way to do that. Okay, yeah. that'd be nice. So people would know what in the world we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do, do, you, do you have your Bible in front of you by any chance? I do. That's that's what I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah. Could you, I'm not going to ask you to read the references, let alone all of the verses, but can you remind me of what, the broad outline of the thing is. Certainly, yeah. The The broad outline is there is only one God. That's the first point. Like, we know that from the entire Old Testament, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then comes this three persons idea. Under that heading, we have the baptism to be in the name of the three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's pretty descriptive. Mm -hmm. uh, you have it in Revelation, worship is ascribed to Jesus. So we know that worship is proper to God only. So that's an indication also. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have each of the three persons being truly and fully God. Um, pretty much nobody has ever disputed that God the Father is God, because that yeah, seems that's, pretty so in, Unless you're an atheist, yeah. Uh, but then you have all the times where Jesus does divine works. He's creating all things, upholding all things, having divine authority to forgive sins, that sort of thing. Divine attributes, names of God. Worship explicitly called God. That's fun. Yeah. Um, and then you have the Holy Spirit. First of all, with the Holy Spirit, you have to prove that he's a person, not just the force. Yeah. It seems that that's been more, his personality or personhood has been more of an issue because once you admit he's a person, the deity follows pretty quickly. And so heretics have usually taken their, their stand on, well, no, he's, he, it's just another name for the power of God or the sovereignty of God or God's influence or some extension from God. And any language that might suggest otherwise is purely metaphorical. And yet as we read scripture, there's nothing particularly metaphorical about simple things like don't grieve the spirit. The spirit assigns spiritual gifts as he will. The spirit speaks to the apostles. The spirit has infinite knowledge because he knows the mind of God. These are these are all attributes of personhood. However you want, to, whatever definition or parameters you want to set of personhood, those things fall within the realm of a person as opposed to some kind of impersonal force, for lack of better words. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so we go there and we talk about those things and then finally talk about the, as I recall, uh, his divine power, divine attributes, uh, that he is on a couple of occasions actually called God. For instance, when Annas and, uh, and Sapphira uh, lie to the Apostle Peter, Peter first says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit, and then he says, you haven't lied to men, you've lied to God, equating the two. And then later on in Paul's writings, the temple of God is the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. It's 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 pretty clear, and we're not making this up, and this is not an invention of Nicaea. This is simply the church wrestling with the words of Scripture and trying to put them in other words that the heretics cannot as easily get around. But of course, what we find in every generation is that heretics come up with new words. And so it's an ongoing battle to keep saying, no, not this, but this. No, not that, but this. <laughs> no, that's not what that means. This is what it means. The favorite tactic of heretics is still to redefine words 
So the, if everything sounds good, we talked about this last time. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses are getting good at it. Redefine the words, redefine the terms of vocabulary so that you sound orthodox. And it takes a number of penetrating questions before you finally hit the weak spot and say, oh, wait, no, that's not right. <laughs> the, there are some Lutherans that I used to listen to. They had a show called Table Talk Radio. Mm -hmm. They would just play games. Uh, but one of the things that they invented was the heresy two-step. <laughs> so you start with your feet firmly planted on the word of God, and then you take a step back into abstraction, mm. <laughs> and then you slide to the left. You're probably not going to slide to the right, but you might. <laughs> but you're going to slide to the left, and that's the heresy two-step. Oh, boy. It's electric. <laughs> well, it seems to me that the, the, the thing we have not talked about and need to, particularly in an age that's confronted by Islam, is what it means to have a tripersonal God, mm -hmm. practically what it means. As we read scripture, we see the Father and the Son talk to each other. We are told that they love each other. They've loved each other for the foundation of the world. There is real personal interaction here. And this, this is really important. We, we, say, we say God is love. And you may remember, you all may possibly remember a trick question on one of your tests. Uh, and it amounted to, why do we say God is love? And at least in the multiple choice form, it's because God loves forever, because God loved us forever. And there were a couple other things that weren't right either. But the, the correct answer, of course, is because the persons of the Trinity love each other forever. If we say... God is love because he loved us, then that makes his Godhead dependent upon his foreknowledge of us. His Godhead depends upon the fact that he is bound to know and create us. We enable God to become God. If we say that God is just love in some abstract sense, it's just some kind of emotion or virtue that percolates around in the essence of God without any fixed goal, person, God just loves in general. Then we have love in general as some kind of high ideal. And it becomes possible for Christians to be wonderful, loving people without ever loving anyone. As mm -hmm. uh, Linus says to Lucy, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. <laughs> and that becomes, that becomes a real thing. If we, if we allow love to be simply an abstract concept, an abstract virtue, we're back to the whole simplicity thing. If love is just a piece of God that has no no real existence except as an abstraction, then we don't have a loving God. Love isn't eternal. The potential for love may be eternal. But then that potential itself implies a completion that hasn't happened yet, and we're back to, and God needs to complete himself by creating us. Uh, again, in my, my former school, we did the poetry contest there too. And some little kid Picked a poem. I've, I've seen it since. I don't remember the author or what it's called, but it amounts to God creates the universe, and it's all beautiful, wonderful. But God goes and sits down a log and looks around and decides that he's lonely. And so he creates man to have someone to talk to. <laughs> How that po poem got in the poetry contest, I'll never know. But there, a lot of people think that way. God needs to complete himself and thus us. He made us so he can complete himself. We are the necessary corollary to God's potential potential for deity, which is to say, we make God God, we are part of God, necessary correlations to God. So when we don't acknowledge the biblical doctrine of the Trinity, the true personhood of the Father and the, the Son communicating in the Holy Spirit through all eternity, we destroy love, we destroy communication, we destroy communion, we leave them at best in abstractions and far more likely as means whereby as we define these terms on our own grounds, because there's no definition in God, this becomes the way we deify ourselves. Hmm. We will, we will, you will be loved. You will be embraced. You will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. To uh, draw this back, I know we opened up that topic by naming Islam. There's an excellent section in K. Scott Oliphant's, I forgot the title of the book all of a sudden. I think it's Covenantal Apologetics. Mm -hmm. It's, it's his defense of uh, presuppositionalism. He has an entire chapter dedicated to a hypothetical conversation between a, uh, a Christian and a Muslim. Oh, really? And it's actually quite fantastic. And basically, one of the arguments that sticks out in my memory is that, A, 
the Islamic conception of Allah is a perfectly non-interactive being. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that he can receive from us. Mm -hmm. and that's about the point where they stop being right. <laughs> um, and there's nothing contingent uh, upon his being that... Essentially, the, the idea was um, there's nothing that keeps him or allows him or forces him by his own will to keep his word. Mm -hmm. The pillars yeah. of Islam and everything that a faithful Muslim does his entire life, he can follow the Quran perfectly. And by the letter of the Quran, he has earned uh, a spot in paradise. And Allah is under no compulsion to keep his word. Well, yeah, because it's, it's, and it's all just from... It doesn't even claim to be like Muhammad. Uh, it, Allah can't even really reveal himself. He's so non interactive that he can't even hold a conversation and reveal his will and his word to people. So you have to have uh, this this guy basically guessing at what's going on and going, um, I'm pretty sure that if this did happen, that he'd want you to do this. <laughs> Sounds Maybe? like Kierkegaard. <laughs> we're back to Ka Kant and Kierkegaard. And we're back to totalitarianism yeah. as well mm -hmm. back to a single stream of power mm -hmm. uh, there's there's no cooperation of any kind yeah exactly you know what poem should be in the poetry contest is the lanyard by billy collins <laughs> are you familiar with it i i am not i'm looking at Haley and saying the lanyard by billy collins Oh, no, like my, my daughters actually love Billy Collins. So does my wife, and we so she's good. put some of his poems into the contest. But I don't know that one. Tell us. Oh, about good. It. Oh, it's this reflection uh, of a young man on the lanyard that he made for his mother at summer camp. How she gave to him life, and uncounted square meals, and legs to walk on, and eyes to see the world, and in return. He made her a lanyard. <laughs> <laughs> Equivalent exchange, am I right? <laughs> I do like that. For, I had to look it up because I was curious. I love the first line. The other day I was ricocheting slowly off the blue walls of this room. <laughs> why do walls, why are they always blue? Anyway. <laughs> back to the Trinity. Coming back to <laughs> this, I think, is where I wanted to go. The Bible reveals... Jesus, the Son, the Word, as the very Word of the Father, the image of the invisible God, the uh, brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. In other words, God by his nature is a self-revealing God. God begets his Son, and he, in his Son he sees himself, and he is well pleased. There are multiple times yeah. in the Gospels where the, son, where the Father renders that, that verdict concerning the Son. This is my beloved son, or thou art my beloved son. In thee I am well pleased. Hear him. Uh, this over against, and I mentioned this on an earlier broadcast, over against the, the pagan gods. Of course, we all know Loki's betrayal of Odin over and over and over <laughs> again. But this that was hardly unusual. Cronus went after Uranus with a scythe and castrated him. Zeus overthrew Cronus in turn in Babylonian mythology. Uh, Marduk uh, goes after his grandma, Tiamat, the chaos monster, and slices her in half and makes heaven and earth out of her. In uh, Egyptian mythology, Isis uh, betrays Ra. Ra, Ra uh, she manages to get him sick and then comes and convinces him that she's the only one who could possibly heal him. But to do so, she has to know his true name, which in magical religions means the that key power word that reveals and captures your identity. And eventually Ra succumbs and, and reveals his true name to her, and she uses it to cripple him and confine him to the sun chariot for the rest of his life or eternity or whatever, while she usurps his, his power. And every time, every place we look in the pagan world, the children turn on the father. It's, it's pretty much like clockwork. But when we come to scripture, the son is the perfect image of the father glorifies the Father. And in fact, when we look at Jesus' priestly, high, high priestly prayer in John 17, the Son asks the Father, glorify me so that I can glorify you with the glory we had together before the world was. 
And then the Holy Spirit is going to come and glorify me so I can glorify you so you can glorify me. And each one reaches out in love to actively do something within Earth's history to glorify the other. Mm. And this sets a pattern for what love is supposed to be like. Now, we go further. We've spoken already of the economic uh, trinity, economic subordination with, within the trinity, where each person, and again, John 17 is a wonderful exposition of this, where each person of the trinity takes upon himself a particular role. The, the father elects, predestines a people and grants these people to the son to save and gives him the job, the work to do. The son comes and does the work. So to glorify his father, he lays down his life. He takes it back again. The Father exalts him to his right hand, and the Holy Spirit pulls all this together and then becomes the means whereby this uh, the salvation is applied to God's elect. And they all work together to accomplish a purpose that is overflowing love. They, they, they were su perfectly sufficient in themselves. They loved each other completely and didn't need us. God did not need man to love. But God's love overflew freely, and he chose to love beyond himself, even at cost, because the father mm -hmm. gives up his son. The son is separated from his father. The Holy Spirit withdraws his comfort from the son, the twofold cry of Jesus, my God, my God, as he, as he mm -hmm. senses his separation from the father and from the Holy Spirit. And yet on the other side, all to the greater glory of the triune God. And so here we have a picture of what love is. Love going even to the point of, of abandoning, of suffering, of uh, accepting um, separation for a greater good on the other side. A love willing to lay down his life. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And this is eternal. This is something in God. It's not some arbitrary thing along the way where God said, well, we compare it to something like um, the uh, the ceremonial law where God said, yeah, and all of you have blue fringes on your, on your robe. Now, it's not purely arbitrary. God had a point. Mm -hmm. But still, there's a big difference between let's all wear blue and let's stay, lay down our lives for our friends. Uh, mm -hmm. The one was a ceremony that, yes, had meaning, but in time passed away. The other is of the essence of ethics and of salvation. Mm -hmm. And without the Trinity, we got none of that. <laughs> yeah. And that is just about all the time we have for tonight. Mm. So thank you all for being here for this discussion. It's been fabulous. It has indeed. It's good to see you all again. <laughs> to see you all. Hi, Talitha. You didn't talk very much. Hi. <laughs> Glad you were here. <laughs> thank you. Hope you can join us again soon. Me too. Uh, we have thanks to give to our producer, David, my lawfully wedded husband. Also to our artist, Maggie Smith. Uh, she did the cover art that is gracing this podcast. Um, you can find her work at maggiesmith.com. Maggie with a Y, not an I-E. So shout out to her. Thank you guys for being here. Send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. See you next time.